and received a question regarding the different forms, physical forms of our planet we can incarnate in and what are the differences for the spirit who is incarnating in these different forms. So we can go up the ladder a little bit and discuss the different forms and what are the advantages and disadvantages of taking such an incarnation. Uh, it's also important to note that there is a lot of knowledge, um, a lot of things being written about incarnation, but a lot of it is actually from a human perspective rather than from a spirit perspective. And also there is a lot of morality to it, people trying to regulate society, making some things good, other things bad on a moral level and creating incarnation to it as a type of reward or a type of punishment. And the things which are written from this perspective, they're not very pure or true. So I'm going against a little bit of some of the existing literature with, uh, with my views. So we will start with some of the simplest forms, the crystalline forms. Um, the crystalline form is a very simple form. Usually you have maybe 10, 20 different types of energy which your energy body is consisting of. Uh, while as a human being you have over a thousand different energies. So the complexity you have is very, very little. But this is also a blessing because you can be very, very pure. You're not confused by all these different energies struggling with each other, competing with each other for attention. You don't have to choose, do I listen to my heart, do I listen to my head, do I listen to tradition, or do I listen to this new ideology or morality. For a stone it is much more about doing one thing uh, as perfectly as possible, so they can very easily move into an optimal form to do one specific thing. The problem is, or the challenge for the stone, is that they have very little understanding of their environment because they see such a small fragment of it. So it's very similar to a human who is trying to understand nature or economy. Uh, they have such a small, yeah, um, you could say, slit through which they can perceive the world, that you cannot know what is going on on the planet or really happening on these much larger scales with lots of dimensions which you've never even thought of. Thought of. And it's the same for a stone, so many things are seemingly coming out of nowhere, are just happening to you. So in the same way as we can in a way be caught by the weather, sudden storms or snowfall. In the same way a stone is also caught up in all kinds of events like being found by being polished, um, ending up in a river or a lake um, or in a forest, wherever it is. So as a stone you really have to accept the circumstances you're in and you can try to communicate, but also your own ability to communicate is very limited. You can make your own energy harmonious and disharmonious. And this is in a way how a stone talks. If it doesn't like something, it will, yeah, in a way try to resist its environment by becoming disharmonious with it and thereby also creating disharmony in its environment. If it likes something, it will in a way become as harmonious as possible and also harmonize its environment. This is also where the healing power of stones comes from. They feed and they harmonize that aspect of our being which is the same as the crystal, as the stone. And while doing that, while in contact with these higher beings, they're slowly getting glimpses of other energies which are connected to their own energy. So, you could say that for their perspective they cannot become one with their environment, but they can radiate their energy, they can influence their environment. And they can perceive a little bit of how their environment reacts 
to the things they do so they get some feedback on how successful or how good it is and but they rely very much on higher beings to tell them what they should do and if it is done in the right way because we have more of a concept um, of indeed if something is good or healthy or working nicely and the thing which is tricky for stones is cooperation uh, every stone has their own area where they work in and they try to do that as best as possible and um, if for instance there's one stone which is trying to feed and stabilize your lower vibrations which is trying to give you health and stability and you have another stone which is trying to help you to heighten, heighten your vibration and to help you to meditate these stones each individually are very helpful very beneficial to you but if you use both of them together then yeah you're caught in between two you know poles of a magnet and you're bouncing back and forth um, so they tend to, to generate stress in such a case and the stones themselves can't usually really understand if what is going on or what is wrong but we as the person who's caught in this field of opposing forces can experience like oh gosh this is not that comfortable and then we can explain it to the stones like when to act how to act and how to become aware of the other stones, the other influences which are in existence. So stones also do grow in their consciousness and in their ability to look beyond their own borders or at least theorize beyond their own borders. So the next form in complexity um, I would like to address is the insect and many people will wonder like what you're not taking the plant as the next lowest form no i'm taking the insect because from the perspective of an insect if it has a consciousness at all which is uh, maybe oddly enough i find that not all stones have a consciousness because of course the experience of a stone can be quite limiting quite boring similarly also insects tend not all to be conscious so not every ant has a spirit connected to it. Often um, a spirit will be more connected to an ant colony or a wasp colony. So they, um, the one spirit is actually having multiple bodies. The form of the insect is very difficult, you could say, almost like a prison for the, for the spirit because the insect itself is very much dominated by pre-programmed responses by certain behaviors which have worked well in the past then become very much you could say machine-like it's an insect is very similar to a robot it has hardwired instructions not software like we have with our brains uh, but hardwired instincts of what to do how to respond to certain stimuli and it just carries them out so for the spirit, which is in such a form, there's actually very little it can do about the actions of uh, its insect bodies. Um, and what is experienced is very much a, you could say, a routine, um, a certain pattern of, of life, a certain pattern of existence. It is a relatively neutral thing. Uh, there are no great emotions, there is no fear, there is no hope, uh, there's more a sense of duty you could say of performing your task and being in your routine. But even being in such a routine can be a liberation from even lower states of consciousness of being indeed trapped in unfulfillable desires or hatred or anger or uh, so it's already a step up where you leave behind lower vibrations you go in towards a more neutral territory. Um, I find insects uh, to be much more difficult to work with than stones. Stones tend to have more curiosity and more adaptability uh, than insects. But insects do have a kind of a consciousness of their uh, routine, the effect of their routine, their own self-efficiency. So they have more of a, a, an awareness 
of their environment because of the bigger range of interactions they have as a mobile living being which is eating and being eaten. So you could say the complexity of energies they are working with is much greater than that of a stone but the freedom of action is actually slightly less than that of a stone. There's less flexibility in their energy bodies. Um, that brings me up to the what we could really call a more human level of understanding where we come to the plants. Um, the spirit of a plant is not that different from the spirit of a human being. Uh, the greatest difference is in the lack of uh, like uh, a fault structure and also the lack of mobility. And actually those two create a rather philosophical attitude. You cannot run away from things you dislike. You cannot tell a beaver to stop eating you, for instance. Um, so you're stuck in a situation where you have to adapt and accept whatever is going on. Um, so when it comes to acceptance and being harmonious both with your own emotions and with the actions of other beings around you, uh, the tree is a perfect learning form. The, the plant form is about being, in a way, constantly being attacked by weather, by uh, animals who are eating you, and accepting your own vulnerability, your own um, lack of control. Also, because they don't have um, a mental structure. Uh, they can only work with their emotions and their emotions are very very deep also because there is no repression of these emotions there's no conflict between the emotions there's no choice should i act out of love or fear because there is no act there is love and there is fear without them being in conflict with each other so plants are great healers are great harmonizers for which in a way help the more complex beings find peace, find rest, find harmony again, which they abandon in a way by going into these more complex forms. So they help us to soften the losses we have by incarnating in mammalian or reptilian form. One of the things which people often don't realize about plants is that plants also communicate with other plants and especially with other plants of their own species. So the spirit of a tree will often have an awareness not only of its own physical body but also of the physical bodies of other plants or other trees for hundreds of meters and sometimes kilometers around. So they're really one with the landscape. They have a very collective consciousness and also very collective experience. So if there is, for instance, um, a forest with lots of beech trees and there's logging going on, then even the beech trees which are in a pristine part, which are maybe in a natural park, will experience the fear of the genocide against their species, which is being perpetrated by humans miles away. And they will be characterized by that fear will react to that fear, they will live that fear, even though they themselves did not experience it with their own physical bodies. So there is a very strong experience of the, of the collective within uh, the form of a tree. Um, trees are also very good with, um, and they are also very good tools for sympathetic magic. So you can use branches, leaves, um, roots, uh, also for working with magical objects or amulets, because the tree itself is very conducive to, uh, to such action, to working and connecting energies. And of course different types of tree, different species, work with different energies and they move energies in different ways. So they're really creating an energetic envelope around our planet 
and creating also the possibility for different types of experiences and different types of thought. So you could say they are weaving a tapestry of energy and we are living within that tapestry of energy. Um, now we are in a way not in a way just living within the nature but we are starting to create nature. We chop down forests, we create fields, we create gardens. But ultimately they create the energetic atmosphere but we are now able to direct um, their actions um, but we're not doing that in a very expert fashion unfortunately. So then we come to the higher forms the reptiles and the mammals and the birds also. The biggest difference you could say between uh, uh, reptiles and birds compared to mammals is their states of consciousness. What we find is that the uh, reptilian forms and bird forms they don't have the you know, thought capacities, the abstraction capacities of mammals. They are very much um, um, sensitive to their environment. They often have much greater energetic sensitivity than mammals do. They really feel what is around them, what is going on around them, um, because they have no uh, agenda, they ha don't have the same amount of fear, planning, expectation, hope, um, which our more yes, mental cortex allows the mammal to have. So the experience of, of being a bird or being a reptile it's usually a very exploratory experience. Um, you are extremely sensitive and you're also extremely mobile. So you could say it's almost a touristy experience of picking up all the different energies, all the different nuances of the earth, of the stones, of the plants, of all the other beings. So it is often their life is very much a sampling life of enjoying and experiencing, tasting all these different energies, all the different yeah, shades which exist in the, in the world. When we come to the mammalian form, the mammalian form uh, is not so interested in the world as it is, but it's much more interested in acting upon the world. The mammalian forms generally have very strong internal drives they're really um, focused on getting attention, getting love, finding a mate, defending their territory, um, rather than just experiencing what structure exists. They're in a way imp imposing uh, their own meaning, their own interpretation of uh, how things are upon the world. So not an energy is just an energy but this is my food or this is my territory this is my mate this is my nest and they're trying to in a way create their own inner world and manifesting it upon the outer world so they're much more in the process of um, creating their own environment out of their own inner impulses so they're very much in their way builders uh, instead of merely adapting to the environment. So they attract a very different type of spirit, a much more ambitious type of spirit, you could say, than all the other forms that tend to attract. So I hope this has given some insight into how the spirits um, differ, or how different spirits are also attracted to incarnating in, in different forms. But how also by working and associating with these different forms you can stimulate different parts, different traits within your own spirit.